Welcome to the Sankofa Ancestor Shrine, where every week we invite spiritual black folk to reconnect with our ancestors as we journey through the crossroads. Please consider donating through patreon.com slash Sankofa Shrine. Ancestors, thank you for your presence on our altars and in our lives. Thank you for the blessings that we have already been receiving and for those that are to come. And please continue to open paths for us so we may find these solutions to any of the problems and questions that we may be facing. Help us to know these paths and recognize them for the blessing they are, for the opportunity they are when we see them. Please protect and look over our family and friends during this hard time and allow us to feel comfort in knowing that we have somebody behind us backing us up a whole bloodline backing us up ready to help us navigate these terrible waters and these situations that are beyond our control Ancestors, please wrap around us as a form of comfort so that we may have our stresses alleviated, our fears alleviated, and instead feel hope and strength and resilience. Ashe. Because our um, theme and talking session is a little longer than I intended today, I thought we would do a short sacred movement session of just moving just moving to something more ambient less music so you don't feel like you have to move your hips and do a whole bunch of things um i thought that this instead would be um really interesting so i found this let me see it was um called into an enchanted forest version 2 um celtic music and 532 Hertz, nature sounds, and a magical forest music. It's all layered on top of each other. From Meditative Mind, um, I'll put the link for that down below. And um, the the song is, it's just, it's a lot of water sounds with a little bit of music playing in the background. So just ambient enough, I think, for us to just chill and listen. Very short, only about two and a half minutes of sound and moving just to get ourselves limber and um, I think we'll do a longer session of this next week when we have a little more time so the videos aren't too long. So real quick, we're gonna do 100 fire breaths and I'll clap every 50 so we can just get ourselves um, in tune and get the oxygen flowing to our brains.
Hello, welcome to the Sankofa Shrine. I'm your host, Tatomi, and today I am wearing my Praise to the Ancestors shirt because it is made by the same person who wrote the book we're about to get into a little bit today. Um, this book is by Medicine Man, who is a third generational root worker from South Carolina with 30 years, over 30 years of practical wisdom in the Gula tradition, uh, traditional way of living. So he's a true blue hoodoo man who comes from a long line of proud root workers. And um, I wanted to bring out this book because I noticed somebody on the Patreon had asked about connecting uh, more closely with George Washington Carver, who we talked about in our last video. Um, we were talking about, you know, his life uh, and the different inspirations that come from it. We were, it was from the guidebook, from the Dust to Onyx guidebook. And so um, we talked about, you know, utilizing him in our work in the gardens and working with him um, throughout our lives because he had a wonderful work ethic. He was a pretty wonderful person by most regards. Um, and so... He's somebody who would be a wonderful ancestor to work with. So we'll talk more specifically about him soon because I didn't see that soon enough to make anything for a video. But I thought hearing about connecting with ancestors in a different way um, would be a, a powerful experience and also helpful. Um, so, and I'll leave the links for this book, his other books, his Facebook page, maybe his YouTube channel if he still has that up. Um, I'll put all that in the description box so that people can connect with him because um, Medicine Man is a really wonderful resource that I'm so grateful that he decided to put himself on the internet um, because I, I just highly recommend his classes. If you're somebody who who wants to just be have that deluge of information from somebody willing to um, teach other black people who's very serious about the tradition, very serious about what this all means. Um, this is the person that I really suggest that people connect with because, um, yeah, he's, he's serious. He's serious about this stuff being for black people. He's serious about the ancestors. He has the knowledge and he's, uh, it, one of his classes, I swear, it will be like, 10 years worth of information you could have gotten on your own, but here you are in this wonderful resource and you only had to pay a little bit of money and this person was able to give you a wonderful live stream that just through him doing things in front of the camera, you learn what you should have been doing or what you should be incorporating into your life or how, how you should act. Uh, he has a wonderful sense of reverence and um, yeah, he's just a really wonderful tool. So. That's why I have this book out, and I thought we might get into some of this information that we have here. Um, he has, uh, we're going to start in chapter four, which is called Ancestral Root Working. But we're going to skip the first, like, four pages or so. Um, he, there he talks uh, about several things, one of which is definitely, uh, like, the chemicals that are in our bodies, and then also foods that we put in our bodies, you know minerals and such and how they affect us because um you know obviously certain how you eat how you act does affect and impact you right um if you're drinking a lot you might be a lot more tired if you're not exercising as much you might be a little more tired um so he's talking about the physical health and how it impacts your magical ability which i think is very very important right um it does this, the cycles of your body, you have to stay in tune with this altar, right? And with this physical altar, it's not something you can just forget about because, um, because you're so focused on the spiritual. And then also I think it's important because I think we, sometimes we get caught up in like fads and such, and we're not thinking of it from the spiritual perspective, from the healthiest perspective. For example, you know, with veganism, um, it's not really something I promote here because veganism is this whole philosophy about you know like saving the animals and we here on this in this um in this shrine we try and talk about the balance right we're talking about the earth as a whole and not just one animal that you really really love right you can love the panda bears you can love the baby seals um but they're not like pandas aren't really vital to the ecosystem anywhere really there's you know what i'm saying so this like fight to to get help certain animals to fight against like fur for example but then vegans will often promote faux fur which is just plastic 
you're just buying plastic. So when we think about the earth, we would think about doing sustainable things, things that overall are really helping the earth instead of, you know, shunning a used fur coat because it's cruel or uh, for a faux fur coat, which is just going to shed, you know, fibers everywhere and pollute the earth, which is pretty cruel as well. And also has a really long lasting impact, much longer than a fur coat will, which can be passed down and breaks down eventually. Um, but the plastic really just doesn't do that. So, you know, that was for me, obviously, I have a I have a faux fur coat in my closet that I think about quite a lot. And it's just a great example in a lot of ways of just how you can be so focused on one thing that you ruin a bunch of other things without really realizing it. So that's why I, I don't really promote like veganism. I promote sustainability. I promote plant based. I promote being healthy, looking at how much is in different things and um, putting it into your infusing it into your, you know, life and making sure that you're you're remaining sustainable. And obviously meat isn't very, very sustainable. Um, so that would come into your calculations. But, um, you know, the, the term veganism just has so much uh, in it. So I don't want to say that that's exactly what we're talking about here. But we are talking about the physical health and not ignoring the physical, which a lot of people he notes here do, root workers and spiritual workers often do, either because they want to eat what they want when they want it, or they want to, you know, go with their own political thing, or they think it just doesn't matter or they haven't even noticed like that they're getting really sluggish when they could be um, switching up their diet in certain ways and switching up their activity with their physical body to help facilitate that. Um, I definitely noticed this year as I've cut back on drinking and um, started doing more exercise more regularly, my uh, energy levels has gone up a ton. So he says here on page 65, the most powerful spiritualist are those that eat the right foods. Like our ancestors have stated, certain foods are for the gods. Have you ever wondered why certain foods belong to certain spirits? We've been taught that certain food items are associated with spirits with spirits based on what the spirit likes. So um, that's very true, right? That's something that we hear often and, you know, we, you know, you, you just kind of go with it. The, the, the oranges are for uh, a shoon, right? Uh, the honey is for a shoon. And the, you know, the, this type of candy is for uh, the man at the crossroads or this type of drink, this type of um, different things. And often it's a pretty, it's a, a whole food, a healthy food. And sometimes it's, you know, uh, country cooking, uh, southern cooking, good old fashioned southern cooking, and then sometimes it's you know liquor, candy, those types of things. So it, it really depends on the spirit. It depends on the thing. But I think uh, overwhelmingly, I would say it, it's usually a food item that's like a whole food. Um, but there are exceptions, obviously, throughout the the you know lexicon of different. Um, spirits in the African traditional religious, you know, space. And um, he says here, I'm not here to attempt to discredit that it's what the, the spirit likes. I'm only going to give a different perspective on what this process means spiritually. When we look at the mineral and healing properties of herbs, we understand that it is a medicine used to keep our bodies operating at a higher frequency of health. When we look at the, some of the medicines that belong to the spirits, we must simply ask ourselves, how can I use this to heal myself? So yes, um, different herbs and different, um, you know, let's see, like different herbs that people consume as well as, you know, burn can also be associated with different um, deities. And then there's also the ones that you naturally are drawn to. Um, when we look at the practices that, have been passed down to us, we have to ask ourselves, why did the ancestors do this? Not everything our ancestors did is still applicable in our lives. The purpose at this point is to learn the lessons from our ancestral lineage so that we don't repeat any of the negative experiences. We must be adaptable to our environment, yet still hold on to our identity. 
Um, I think that's really a, such such an astute observation that not everything the ancestors did is absolutely necessary for us to continue doing today. Uh, it's not always going to serve you. It's not always going to be even worth it to just copy blindly what they are doing. It's not always about what they were doing. It's about why they were doing or what was the purpose behind what they were doing because, um, you know, some things just don't apply anymore. Uh, and so he, and I love how he was also talking about holding on to the identity because I've noticed that's something a lot of people really struggle with. Um, I've noticed it, especially when I was studying Native American, um, art and such this in uh, my college classes the last few years, because I noticed how many people, you know, there was this, this interesting debate about like, what is Indian art? Is it art? Is it Indian art if it's not if it doesn't look like there's it's portraying Native Americans the way people think it should be if it's not a traditional form if it's not traditional or is it still Native art if it's a person who's Native creating the art and whatever they've created is Native art um, and so I think that's always an interesting discussion because I do see you know I think a lot of Black people feel kind of held in the same thing. Is it black art if I'm not portraying only black people or if I'm not portraying only black, uh, what's popular among black people, um, that sort of thing. And it can get really, it can get confusing in that way because it's still black art if a black person created it, right? And so you still have to find ways to hold on to your identity even as you're expressing yourself for the future, even as you're expressing yourself um, with other things because because you're still trying to, you're still trying to tell your story right through your artwork. So it's not enough to just, um, it's not, I don't think it's right for us to be dismissing modern things is mostly what I'm saying. It's, it can get really difficult. It can get really dicey, but I think focusing on what matters, which is the spirit behind things, what people are creating and what it offers to the community is highly important. Um, and remembering that we do have to be modern. We do have to adapt. We do have to accept the fact that things will never be what they once were and um, be able to adapt to that and allow those modern necessities to not make us feel bogged down or left behind or like we're less than because we still have so much, so much to offer and so much to, um, so, so, so much higher to rise and grow uh, spiritually. So he says, being adaptable signifies that we should practice our mode of spirituality within our cultural context, which means that we should integrate our lives fully into the practice. So this is kind of what I mean by connecting with the ancestors for different things, because what you're looking for is to have the ancestors infused into our everyday lives, right? We want to have it, um, we want our whole life to be infused in the spiritual. And that's something that I think a lot of Black people have experienced, especially with Christianity, but making that switch to um, African traditional religion, to uh, our ancestors, into something that is not upheld by somebody else's system, it's proven very difficult, right? Because it doesn't have quite the same foundation that we're, we're used to seeing because it hasn't been fed like that. And... Um, the, remembering that you know there are ways to infuse into your everyday life and make it an everyday thing is part of this it's integrating your life fully into the practice your whole life it starts becoming infused with spirituality even down to how you you know clean your house how you dress yourself how you speak to other people that's you know what I'm saying so that's what we talked about with the sacred woman book that's what that's really about is about that infusion of spirit into everything you do into everything you you are and so that's what he's talking about here is is taking this ancestral knowledge taking this connection to the ancestors and starting to infuse it into your everyday life starting to infuse the spirit into your everyday life um and not being shy about it you know not being shy to to um hang up pictures of certain ancestors or call out to them or um channel the energy of them so he says here the same way you get up in the morning to brush your teeth and wash your face is the same way you should commit to your spiritual work you must place every act that you do on a cycle where you repeat it every day near the same time allow yourself to adjust without feeling discouraged or confused about if you should do something or not you must have extreme confidence in your work 
This is essential to bringing your manifest ma manifestations to life. So this is probably one of the most powerful things he writes in the entire book. Easily. Easily. There, there is our answer. The same way you think, oh, I should brush my teeth. Oh, it's time to go wash my face. The same way you do that is how your spirituality should be in your everyday life. The same way you think that, you should think about, you know, your prayer. The same way you wash the house, you should think about infusing that wash with prayer, with words, with um, a dollop of Florida water, right? The same way you do it, it should become second instinct to be just addressing the ancestors, to be infusing your spiritual essence into everything in your home, uh, into everything that you work, you know, your job, your finances, what have you. Um, and it should be a habit in the sense that you do it so often that it becomes second nature. Um, and so that's something that I think we can all really come to, um, we can all really come to uh, bring into our lives because it's it makes more sense that way the way he says it right um finding and this is also when he's talking about this uh i think that this is also a really interesting opportunity to find ways to infuse prayer into your life as a habit maybe before your meal maybe uh, before you go to bed maybe with your children prayers before you go to bed um, and that's a really great way to also bring the children into it because children want to pray children want to be interacting with their ancestors they see you at the ancestor altar and they obviously um they get a sense of reverence around the altar as well and they also want to participate so that's a another way you can do it is just by having it be habit in your home and if you get your kids into it Honey, you get your kids into a habit and they will never forget. You're the one who's going to be forgetting and they're going to be like, uh, did you do your prayers? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're going to be like, wait, we didn't pray before we ate. They're going to be the ones who call you out. So if you're really dedicated and you have kids, that's that's the easy way. So, um, yes, you must have extreme confidence was the other thing. So. That part I think is really great too because it reminds you to not beat yourself up. I know we we when you get told to do things, especially like with the book like Sacred Woman, it gets easy to drop into this like not like I'm a sinner type of thing, but basically, you know, you're just like, "Oh, I can't keep up. I can't do this. I can't do that. Everything I'm just doing terrible." But, you know, being at ease with yourself, being in the moment with yourself, uh, is so important. It's so important because it allows you to uh, not not just be beating yourself up about it, but be like, okay, like now I'll do this now, or now that that was how this schedule had to be. But you know, have confidence in your in your work and your life in that way, so that you're not beating yourself up, angry at yourself, and um, you're not discouraged and discouraging yourself actively. That's a, you know, it's, it's really hard to continue going when you're the one internal voice discouraging yourself because you're not keeping up to this standard. And of course, we always give ourselves a really high standard. We, you know, we want a lot of, out of ourselves. We want ourselves to do great things. Um, but, you know, when you put yourself up at this standard, you have to understand sometimes you're going to fall a little bit short of that and you're not becoming complacent with falling short. You're understanding that as a human looking for this balance, new to some of these things, you are going to run into times where you're not going to totally hit the stars, right? Um, but they say, you know, you reach for the stars, you reach for the moon, but then you land among the stars because you, you reach for these high places. So it's good to have these elevated lofty goals, but at the same time, it's highly important for you to, um, you know, make sure you're not being discouraged just because you landed among the stars and that's just not good enough for yourself. You know what I mean? Or you landed among the clouds and you're like, gosh, dang it. You know what I mean? But it's it's not necessary to discourage yourself, to speak down to yourself. Uh, keep, keep up speaking yourself and keep believing in yourself and keep understanding that every time you remember, just the fact that you remembered is a good sign that you're, you're building this habit, you know? So, um... Adding your work to your daily routine helps to program your spirit with the deepest messages of your desires. So because this is something you're constantly doing, something you're constantly putting your effort into, something that you're infusing into um, your everyday work, your everyday life, it becomes 
uh, it becomes something that you're putting out there, almost like a steady stream. It's just this reciprocal cycle. And that's really what he's talking about here is adding your work to your daily routine to make it second nature. Um, and that helps build up the confidence so that you're not all the time feeling kind of foolish, feeling really alone. Um, it took me a long time to get there. It's, it's finally, it's to the point where I, I don't really ever feel alone. Even when I feel alone, like in the physical realm, I never feel alone in the spiritual realm. I always feel like someone's there comforting me or, you know, whispering a few good ideas into my mind, always. So, it, but that took a while. But that took a while. It, it takes a while to get to that point sometimes because you are so used to, one, having, you know, like the Bible and the church and everybody's kind of telling you what to think in a lot of ways. So you don't really ever have to rely on yourself in that way. But when you're somebody who's having to reclaim something that's, been destroyed and kind of pushed underground in a lot of ways it's it's a little more lonely in a sense because you don't have people just all around you who who believe all the time right we we are often alone until we get online until we reach our facebook spaces our instagram spaces wherever it is that we found on social media to help and connect with each other our discord groups you know but um when you're in when, when you're out here it's, it does feel really lonely it does feel you know, like you're you're the only one working for stuff or like you have to wait for answers and it can be very frustrating. But adding your work to your everyday life and giving yourself that foundation of prayer, of altar work, of um, just speaking out loud to your ancestors, just practicing that by yourself, just the, those quick prayers, those quick um, sentences to them uh, will really help add to your daily routine and help your confidence level grow up, grow, uh, you know, exponentially because you're able to really feel like you have something to draw on to, to go do when it time is necessary. So once these messages have been deeply rooted, they begin to project outwardly, attracting all the pieces to the puzzle that would make your desire complete. How does this happen? On a subtle level, we have thoughts. So um, you, you have these messages that have become deeply ingrained because of your, your constant work at them, right? Because of your constant belief in them, your faith in them, your willingness to put your faith in them. So the messages um, of the ancestors and also the messages of what you, you need are rooted in you and they start projecting outwardly and because you're projecting this stuff outwardly you're going to start attracting things that have to do with that so uh that's why we're trying not to be discouraged all the time and like hating on ourselves because we know that each of these small steps we're taking is going out there and doing something hitting something else that's going to hit in back into us so it's uh it's a very reciprocal process he says, on a subtle level, we have thoughts. These thoughts are held in compartments called cells. These cells transmit thoughts from one another telepathically. And what this means is that our deepest desires can communicate with other desires that have the same level of conviction as we do. This is what makes those two re realities merge. This is what makes our magic work. Even our heart has a role in the power that we exert to manifest our dreams and desires. So you're reaching out to the rest of your own self, but you're reaching out also to others, to other energies, your ancestral energies, your spirit guide energies, other hoodoo people, root working people that you um, have uh, who are also working. Um, situations where that, that kind of relate to yours, such as that job you want. And they're, they're pushing out the energy that they need somebody who can do what you do. Um, so we have this whole situation where there's two things are coming at each other with the same level of conviction, uh, similar levels of conviction. And having that conviction behind you is why that's why that's necessary, right? So the heart is a magnetic generator that radiates biomagnetic frequencies to the universe. These frequencies are every memory and experience that we collect while living. They are being transmitted and added to the universal dynamic that we call spirit, that we call God, whatever you call it. These transmissions are being done internally as well. Our genes act as recording agents, recording everything about us as individuals and nations, then storing it for future generations to access. So there you have it. That is a really huge thing. He's talking about the fact that as you're moving through this world, 
you are creating this, what is he, what's his words, recording, you are recording everything that's occurring to you. So but you're learning, you're taking, your body is taking notes, right? They say these things, the generational trauma exists, right? You can pass on the trauma, but you can also pass on generational love, generational knowledge. And so you do have this whole thing going on where you're recording, but you also have to remember, this isn't just about the generations that are coming after you, your descendants, this is about who came before you. They all had the same thing occurring. Their bodies, those frequencies, they're pushing out everything the same as you. They're getting all those memories recorded into the bloodline at the same time. So you have a wealth of answers within you. Uh, it can be difficult because we feel so alone. But at the same time, we have this wealth of information within us, written within our DNA, written within our bodies, um, passed down from person to person through the ancestral bloodline. So uh, knowing that we have answers within our own genes, um, answers within our own selves, that's why meditation is actually so important. And taking that time to breathe with your own mind is so important. Taking that time to, um, you know, really access what's inside of you is important because often we're out there looking for everybody else and we feel really discouraged when we're trying to look for within ourselves um because we think that there's nothing there we're like oh well, you know i need to i need to know i need to know other things but there is stuff that's in here for us to know and there's wisdom in here for us to know and uh, he's going to talk about it a little bit but you know there are messages that we get that aren't really just our random thoughts. It's the ancestors and spirit guides talking with us. And sometimes we're just like, we only get a couple of those messages because our brain is just so loud. But having that ability to quiet it down, we will we'll be able to hear a lot more than when your brain is in a panic and then all of a sudden you get a good idea, right? But you can get some more if your brain is calm and quiet and you're able to kind of be in control of your thoughts and understand uh, and sort through some of them even. He says, um, as our genes record our experiences, our ancestors get involved from a subtle level, influencing our actions and thoughts from the for the betterment of our lives. So uh, the genes are being recorded and your ancestors are taking note and they're understanding because they, they understand things from a different perspective, a wider perspective, one that um, sees from a, more of a whole and has more of a plan for the future than we could ever have because we just can't see it from that spiritual perspective. Um, he says, most times we don't even know where these thoughts come from, yet we accept them as our own without judgment. These voices that we hear are the ancestors downloading correct thoughts and behaviors to us genetically. As spiritualists, working with the ancestors is important because we train ourselves to tap into the genetic pool of information willingly while others receive sporadic messages. Yep, that's exactly what I was just trying to explain, except he just said it a lot more simply. So <laughs> you are basically, everybody's getting these messages, but most of the time we're just getting it. And then we're like, oh, okay, great idea. Okay, new plan. <laughs> and we go in on it. But when you're deliberately trying to access those messages, when you're deliberately taking the time to calm your mind and listen, honey, you get so much more. And so that's, you know, when we're talking about connecting with different ancestors, that's a lot of what it is. You're connecting with your bloodline, you're connecting with ancestors who are well known in the community. Um, one of the things I did notice uh, when I was reading this book recently, I've read this part of this to you, The Prayers of African uh, Religion. Uh, Mbiti is, I believe, yeah, it's up here. Mbiti is, uh, he was a a wonderful man who he was Christian but he did study the African religions and he did Africanize a lot of things and he was very respectful to African traditional religions in that way um, but he noted how uh, uh, traditionally people didn't really talk to as many ancestors outside of their bloodline and so that to me says that there's a good chance that that's something we picked up a couple centuries ago when we were in the diaspora because we had to start making our gods and goddesses saints in the catholic church right little or whatever those little cards are they're not always totally saints i'm not sure if they're always official but we definitely had them and then also uh utilizing the and praising and honoring the ancestors who have managed to become famous wealthy well-to-do philanthropists um help with the community um 
you know, uh, people who volunteered heavily in the community. We started uplifting those people in our community and eventually venerating the people once they passed on. Um, and likely this is, a, we, we've expanded it because we had to be so disconnected in the diaspora through the slave trade and um, other oppressive racist systems that were continuously tearing our families apart through death, lynching, prison, you know, wrongful imprisonment, making people have to leave entire places to stay safe. Uh, it's it's been a mess. So it doesn't surprise me that we've gotten we had we at some point in co colonization. It must have been three, four hundred years because we can find people who were ancestrally venerating. You know, people who weren't necessarily totally related to them a couple centuries ago. I'm just rambling, but I th I noticed that when I was reading this and I thought that was so interesting that he noticed that traditionally that wasn't a thing, but then it became a, more of a thing. Um, so, you know, being willing to receive those messages from those ancestors, talking to them, um, offering them a prayer, putting up their picture, making a statue out of um, some terracotta, some earth clay. Uh, I have some here and I actually have a plan to um, I have a plan to, uh, make some things out of it. So that's my hope. My hope is to make something out of this clay. So we'll see, we'll see what occurs. Um, but you know, making a statue, making something of that nature is really important and something that I think, um, that, that helps people have a tangible thing to really center their, thoughts around their uh, make an altar, make a shrine of some sort and um, work in that way. So where was I? Oh, yes. Um, instead of we receive information willingly instead of sporadically, right? That's what we're looking for. As we receive messages from our ancestors, we go deeper by developing ways to conjure their power and presence fully into our lives to protect us from evil spirits other people have walking with them. Some good people do have the most nefarious spirits walking with them. Um, that's the absolutely true. It's very sad. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just from being spiritually disconnected. It's also just from where they are in life. And sometimes you really actually do have to battle, even if it's not something that, you know, you asked for or like you saw coming or something. Sometimes, you know, things do happen that you need to actively work against because they're coming in and perpetrating on your life. This may seem hard to believe, but only a trained spiritualist will be able to tell what type of spirit is walking with a person. I do think that people typically have an intuitive feeling about things that they should follow <laughs> because uh, I think a lot of us do have the intuitive knowledge to kind of sense if something's wrong with a person, even, but you know, I think a lot of us also, because we're not as trained, we'll, we're more willing to brush it off and just be like, oh no, that's a nice person though. I know like, so-and-so would never do anything like, so she's great, you know? But at the same time, there, there was that feeling. And I do think that we often ignore that little intuitive feeling and go against our better judgment because we like, like somebody or we don't completely trust our intuition in that way. We're always questioning it. So um, I do agree with him, though, that, you know, it takes it takes some sort of training to not only be able to see it, but to be able to trust what you're seeing and be able to follow through and understand what you're seeing. Because he says we must be very careful with the people we let in our homes for this reason. It's like because, you know, if you're you're really secure in yourself spiritually and you know something's off. It can still be really hard to go against the social etiquette of just not wanting certain people in your home or of, uh, you know, you let people in your home and then you have to like smoke cleanse and wipe down the whole damn thing because, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're just not all, they're just not the safest person to have in your house spiritually. Um, so he says people carry the vibrational energies of everyone and everything that they've been around since they woke up. So... Um, you know, and a lot, most people ain't out here cutting cords, spiritually cutting, mentally cutting themselves away from people, objects, things, and they just kind of end up getting saddled with whatever. And then they, you know, if things happen and it's, it sucks, but, uh, if there is, these spirits absolutely do attach themselves to good people, mostly because they're oblivious and they, then they're curious about why things are kind of going awry. When you are around a lot of negative energy harboring people, they distribute negative energy towards you indirectly. This is one of the reasons why hoodoo practitioners work with their ancestors for protection. The ancestors are central to protecting your home. 
Many root workers build their ancestral altars in common areas of the home to protect them. Uh, so that would be the living room, the dining room, even the kitchen can have one. Um, I still have this shelf up on my kitchen that I have yet to put anything up there, but I do have this clay, so I might make a couple small uh, statues to put around, um, some some sculptures to put around on those different areas to, to just to spread this protective energy. Um, many root workers build, oh yeah, sorry, in the common areas, as light is given to your ancestors, they will manifest changes in your life. The light that you give them is the power of your emotional energy. So he explains it right here, you know. It's um, it's the work that you're putting in. That's why they call it root work, right? We're The work that you're putting in, uh, it comes back tenfold because the ancestors know you're paying attention. So they're more likely to be giving you more direct messages. They're more likely to intervene because you've asked them to. They're more likely to, um, they're more likely to do, to show themselves in a bunch of ways in your life, especially the ways that you're asking because they're now more involved and you're feeding them, you're feeding them energetically. So, you know, even when, when you're cooking, you're putting all that energy into the food that you put on a plate to put on the altar, or you're putting your energy into this prayer. You're putting your energy into these blessings. You're putting your energy into talking with others, to reading certain books and to uh, playing certain music you know you're putting your energy into those things so it's not just about the act but it's about the emotion that you're putting behind the act the spiritual energy that you're putting behind the act um so pouring out your emotions to the ancestors triggers a reaction in the spiritual world that releases the power of all the spirits that support you let me say that again. Pouring out your emotions to the ancestors triggers a reaction in the spiritual world that releases the power of the, all the spirits that support you. You have to call out to them. You have to give them that. Uh, reach out. You know, it's not... Um, it's not just, you know, like you can give them the, your stress, you can give them your happiness, you can give them your ideas. And this energy that you're putting into it, this emotional energy absolutely reaches out to the ancestors triggers this response in which you're you're actually calling out you're actually saying it out loud or writing it down or what have you however it is that you manage to do it stay safe obviously if it's you're not in a place where you can be writing shit down yelling shit out calling shit out the window please don't stay safe um but if you can you should and um he says here this depends on how connected you are to your own emotions. Many people think they are in tune with their emotions, but that is something that only a few have been able to achieve. Our emotions are part of a sequence of chemicals released by neurotransmitters that send off vibratory signals through the body. This vibration is what's essential in the process of root working. The inner force must be called forth to unleash our desires into the world. So he's talking about the um, control um, and the understanding of your own body and the emotions that are coming with it and so this is something that definitely comes with practice because you um hold on all right my husband had to come in and so i now totally forgot where i was <laughs> with that part but i did want to um i did know we were talking about the emotions and uh, learning to understand your emotions, becoming in tune with your emotions, and being honest with yourself about what emotions you have, especially negative emotions that are just constantly bringing you down, or that you find you you see that there's like a, a pattern of you getting stuck when you have that emotion, or you get paralyzed by this emotion or that emotion. Um, that's that's practice, like he said. That's training. That just comes with practice. Comes with you working on it. Um, especially if you've been raised in a way that you're just constantly getting caught up in your own emotions, getting caught up in, um, you know, what, you know, what, whatever it is. If I, I want to say it, it's not like you're getting caught up. It's more like you've just, you've been trained you been your whole life. You've gone a certain way. And so now going the other way, it feels damn near impossible. It feels impossible to think about what your emotions are and it feels impossible to to get a hold of them because your emotions have been kind of ruling your life uh so that is kind of the rock bottom of where to start where your where emotions always rule your life or where certain emotions rule your life but finding ways to really understand and be uh honest with yourself 
honest with yourself like because you can see other people and you'll be like I like I'm like that but then you you're really honest with yourself and you're like I am not like that I can be I can I can be really proud of that person and think they're really cool and amazing and still admit to myself fully I am not even half that okay I do that all the time like I I'm somebody who like I'll read something I'll be like I'm like that and then like later on I am in the throes of something and I'm like why did I ever think I was like that I'm clearly not. I'm clearly too emotional in that regard. So, you know, being honest with yourself is kind of the number one there because it kind of hurts to hear someone be like, oh, you know, most people aren't really connected to their emotions and what it means when all these different things. But then there comes a time when you're actually able to really sense when certain things are occurring, when you're actively changing and remain aware of it. And I think that's one of the first steps is really being aware of what's going on there. So, um... He goes on to say, we're almost done, I think. My goodness, we should do the rest like later, maybe. In African ancestral traditions, this process is described as the interaction of spirits. What our ancestors did was connect their innermost being with nature. They created sound scientific practices that allowed them to build civilizations that could prosper from the foundations that they left. The interconnection with nature meant that our ancestors had a working knowledge of not only their environment, but also of themselves to be able to diagnose disease without modern instruments. Okay, so we are going to come back because we still have several pages of this and I already hit 40 minutes. I don't know where that 40 minutes went. I'm so sorry. I just talked way too much, but we're going to start off with nature next week. We will talk about nature and we will talk about, um, you know, first, uh, he, he talks about, uh, what was this part? Oh, he talks about like the predatorial world around us and protecting ourselves spiritually and also protecting our traditions because people are out here, they're, they're not actually interested in supporting. They're just trying to find a way to monetize, to use, to find some way to continue to control the black community, even when it looks like we're moving beyond certain people's control. Uh, so, you know, being aware of that. And um, also, of, he'll, he talks a bit about altar work and connecting with our altars, which is important. And also building the altar and how we would build an altar for any ancestor. That is going to be next week. I had meant for it to be this week and somehow I just took way too long. And I don't mean for these videos to be this long because no one ever watches them when they hit one hour. It just is what it is. When they're 30, 45 minutes, people will watch. But when it's an hour, I can't get anyone to watch. <laughs> so I blew it this time. Next time we'll get into the other stuff. And thank you so, so much for watching. Thank you for everybody who watches, who shares, who comments who donates on the Patreon $1, every single person. A couple of you donate $5, one or two of you donate $10, and it's a huge blessing because it allows me to continue to talk to, talk to everybody. It, it gives, um, because I get to talk to people, people can message me and ask questions, and we can always keep building up this community. Um, and I think that's so important because so many of us miss being able to go somewhere every week and connect spiritually, especially since we've left the Abrahamic, you know, space and there's just really no other space to fill in the blanks, sad as that is. So it's really important and wonderful when we get to instead um, create our own space, create our own church in a sense. Uh, and in that way, we can connect spiritually, we can learn, we can grow, and we can thrive and create a foundation that's really solid for the next generations that come up behind us. Thank you so much for watching again, and may your ancestors and spirit guides be with you at every crossroads. I will see you next week.